The great oak tree had stood on a hill over the Hudson. It had stood there for hundreds of years, and he thought it would always stand there. One night, lightning struck the oak tree. It lay broken in half, and he looked into its trunk as into the mouth of a black tunnel. The trunk was only an empty shell. Its heart had rotted away long ago. There was nothing inside. Just a thin gray dust that was being dispersed by the whim of the faintest wind. The living power had gone, and the shape it left had not been able to stand without it. His shock came when he stood very quietly, looking into the black hole of the trunk. It was an immense betrayal. The more terrible because he could not grasp what it was that had been betrayed. It was not himself, he knew, nor his trust. It was something else. John Gold. John Gold. Who is John Gold? Who is John Gold? John Gold. You have heard it said that this is an age of moral crisis. You have cried that man's sins are destroying the world, and you have cursed human nature for its unwillingness to practice the virtues you demanded. Since virtue to you consists of sacrifice, you have sacrificed justice to mercy. You have sacrificed wealth to need. You have sacrificed self-esteem to self-denial. You have sacrificed happiness to duty. You have destroyed all that which you held to be evil and achieved all that which you held to be good. Why then do you shrink in horror from the sight of the world around you? That world is not the product of your sins. It is the product and the image of your virtues. You have fought for it. You have dreamed of it. You have wished it. And I, I am the man who has granted you your wish. In 1957, novelist Ayn Rand published her last novel. She called it Atlas Shrugged. The setting was America, in an apocalyptic and not so distant future. Rand said it was the day after tomorrow, and it was a warning. If Rand was here today, she would point to almost anything that's going on in government right now and say, I told you so. The novel is so predictive of what's going on today. Regulation breeds regulation. Controls breed controls. Government will grow, freedoms will shrink. And that has all come true. A devastated economy caused by government intervention, leading to more and more and more government intervention, which makes it worse and worse and worse. They go after if your stock goes up, your stock goes down, your stock goes sideways, you know, no matter what happens, they're going after you. And the ones that pay is everyone in society. We have uh, unfortunately moved very much in the wrong direction, predicted in the Atlas Rug, a society based on collectivism, a uh, society where individual rights are really under, a, un, under attack. It seems like you're replaying Atlas Shrugged uh, as you're uh, reading the newspaper. It was astounding to me. I mean, she just understood way ahead of her time what it was all going to lead to. Moral decay, intellectual decay, economic decay. Hey, there's a book that predicted that, you know, 50 years ago. America in the late 1940s and through the 50s was enjoying one of the most peaceful and prosperous periods in our history. Yet Rand had detected a fundamental change in America's direction that, if continued, would lead the most prosperous nation on Earth into exactly the kind of bleak dystopia depicted in Atlas Shrugged. For many readers, this idea was puzzling. The world of Atlas Shrugged was nothing like the real America. Or was it?
Atlas Shrugged tells the story of Dagny Taggart, operations vice president of a transcontinental railroad, and her struggle to keep the trains running, even as government regulators and business cronies with political pull conspire to loot the country's economy and cripple its infrastructure. The crisis deepens as one by one the men of the mind the vanguard of industry, commerce, education, finance, and the arts simply vanish as if abducted by a mysterious destroyer. The book was rejected by critics, but quickly became a bestseller, and during the course of the last 54 years has never been out of print, selling to date over 7 million copies. But despite the book's enormous popular success, Atlas Shrugged marked the greatest disappointment of Rand's career because her purpose for writing the novel had gone unfulfilled. She thought that there would be a minority, but a vocal minority of intellectuals who would recognize what philosophical achievements she had done with Atlas Shrugged, but it didn't happen. With Atlas Shrugged, she had intended to do far more than entertain. Rand had hoped to change what she saw as America's relentless march towards the dystopia and disaster depicted in her novel. She saw the intellectual underpinnings of some very bad things that were occurring in prosperous times that had nothing to do with current prosperity, but a tremendous amount to do with prosperity 50 years from now. She wrote the book, Rand said, to prevent it from coming true. But in post-war America, there was little evidence, on the surface anyway, to support the novelist's dire prediction. The problem was nothing you could see or touch. The problem, it seems, was philosophy. born Elissa Zinonevia Rosenbaum in Tsarist Russia in 1905, first of three sisters to a St. Petersburg pharmacist. How smart were you in school when you were a little girl? Very. Yeah. I was the top student. In, I went to two different schools in two different cities, and I was the top student there. <laughs> Alyssa knew by the age of nine that writing would be her life's work. The first things I wrote was movie scenarios because I had seen some movies. Then at 10, I started writing novels, and I was writing at home and at school. I would sit in the back row, you see, and put a book in front of me and, and write the novels. I began to suddenly found myself, in effect, uh, asking a lot of whys in an abstract manner, but beginning to define the reasons for what I believe. And then I realized that what I was now doing is, uh, is thinking in principle. She was 12 years old when the revolution began. Her father's business was taken away. Red soldiers marched in and closed the shop up, and he never worked again. What she saw as a 12-year-old girl was that the people who had worked hardest and achieved most were punished. She came from a family of very hardworking people who were utterly broken by having that removed from them. By the time she arrived in New York Harbor in 1926, Alyssa believed she had left the soul-killing clutches of communism far behind. By then, partly to protect her family in Russia, the outspoken would-be screenwriter had changed her name to Ayn Rand. She came to the U.S. in the 1920s when the economics of the United States was the wonder of the world. It was the dollar decade, and capitalists were just having a roaring good time. And then the Depression hit. 
you have the Great Depression. It looks like capitalism has failed. And in some ways, it, you know, it truly had. Markets had failed, people were out of work. And there was a real sense that socialism or communism is the answer. This is a better way. We have an example in Russia showing the way. She voted for Franklin Roosevelt in 1932. And then, almost instantaneously, he began to regulate the economy in ways that reminded her of her homeland in Russia. And she became really alarmed. A few timid people who fear progress will try to give you new and strange names for what we are doing. Sometimes they will call it fascism, and sometimes communism, and sometimes regimentation, and sometimes socialism. Rand, coming from Russia, who had seen the Soviet Revolution up close, her antenna were very much more sensitive than the average Americans, because she had seen what totalitarianism, collectivism, and socialism does to a country and to the soul of the people. She'd already seen what, what it did in the Soviet Union, that individuals like belong to the state, millions of people mass murder. She saw the United States move in that direction. She was terrified. It took her a while to understand that there was a movement uh, within the government and much more so outside the government to institute socialism in the United States. These collectivist ideas, said to be grounded in the best intentions, were not far removed from the traditional Christian values of 19th century rural America. Many of these people also came out of the social gospel tradition in American history. Social gospel really starts more 1870s, 1880s, and this is the sense among Protestant Americans that they had a duty, a religious duty, to reform the world, that if they succeeded in reforming the world, they could actually hasten the return of Jesus Christ. The progressive era, which begins with Woodrow Wilson's election in, in 1912, begins an era of social awareness to sort of bring people out of poverty. The dominant American Protestant religious philosophy, I am my brother's keeper, we need to do something about the poor, and we need government to do it. This was the first time that government was, was looked at as the savior rather than private charities. Rand's debut novel, We the Living, was her first attempt at depicting the inherent threat posed to the individual by collectivism. You see, you and I, we believe in life, but you want to fight for it, to kill for it, even to die for life. I only want to live it. We the Living was a very important moment in Rand's coming to political consciousness. It draws from her own family background. It tells a story of two, um, you know, well-off Russian families, and they, in the revolution, they lose their property, and no publisher would buy it. And they would say, you know, Ayn Rand really doesn't understand Russia. Maybe it was that way in the 20s, but things are different now, right? And this is when, you know, millions of people are starving to death. Lillian Hellman and any number of other people would go on trips to Russia, and they'd be escorted around to see the, you know, the beautiful new factories and the, and the beautiful new buildings that were being built. And they never saw the fear and the hunger. Purges and the man-made famines and the gulags and the mass murders. Walter Durante, we know today, he was a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter for the New York Times. He was in the Soviet Union. He saw it. He basically lied in his reporting. When published finally in 1936, we the Living sold only a few thousand copies. Rand's royalties amounted to a meager $100. The fact that the book was largely ignored solidified Rand's fears that her warning had arrived too late. She thought she'd escaped Russia and come to the land of freedom of opportunity. And when she saw the reception of We the Living, that started to change. With her next published novel, The Fountainhead, Rand once again used fiction to champion the individual and creative freedom. The theme of The Fountainhead, she said, was individualism versus collectivism, not in politics, but in a man's soul. What, is, what does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to be a human being? Before you can do things for people, you must be the kind of man who can get things done. But to get things done, you must love the doing not the people. Your own work, not any possible object of your charity. My reward, my purpose, my life 
is the work itself. My work done my way. The characters represent sort of fundamental truths of, of, of our instincts. And our instincts are to uh, pursue our happiness, to pursue our talents, to pursue the things that we love. Her characters are so big and so heroic. They're glamorous and giant scale. I mean, I'm talking about big time, real concepts here. Unlike We the Living, The Fountainhead found an enthusiastic audience and became a bestseller and a movie. This was the beginning of the Rand pattern. You know, somebody reads The Fountainhead, they become absolutely taken with it. And the fan letters that come in from The, the Fountainhead, some of them are just incredibly intense, you know. It changed my life. I feel like you were speaking directly to me. I've never felt free before, and now I feel free. The one thing people kept saying was they felt light when they would read the book. They would feel a feeling of weightlessness. Or also, I feel like I'm awake for the first time. But many of these new fans, and most reviewers, missed the point. People thought it was a really kind of um, awkward but interesting book about architecture which infuriated Ayn Rand. What the reviews didn't really do was address and unpack her theme of individualism and individualism versus collectivism. And they didn't really link it to current events. They took it more as a story. So I think that was extremely frustrating for her. The Fountainhead represents something totally new. What it represents is wanted and liked by the public. But since it's so new, it frightens and bewilders all the so-called experts. They don't know what to make of it, nor what it's all about. Disappointed and frustrated with what she considered inane reviews for The Fountainhead, Rand pondered her next novel, searching for a scenario that would more clearly define and expand her themes of individualism and man as his own moral ideal one that even the most obtuse reviewer could not fail to miss. A friend of hers told her that she should write a nonfiction book to explain what The Fountainhead was all about. And she said, no, I won't do that. If they can't understand, I'm not going to explain it to them. It's all there in the book. And furthermore, what if I just refuse to tell them anything at all? in the future. What if I went on strike? And then she turned to her husband, Frank O'Connor, and said, that's a good idea for, for a book, The Mind on Strike. What if all the brilliant creative people, the brilliant engineers, the brilliant inventors decided to stop showing up for work, and they all disappeared? And what was left was all the tax collectors and the guys who say, I should have more. And they're left with nobody wanting to create any value for them. September of 1946, uh, she started writing Atlas Shrugged, uh, whose provisional first title was The Strike, about what the consequences would be of the great men of the mind, the great industrialists, the great businessmen, the great independent intellectuals and scientists withdrew their services from the society. And then the society would learn who was exploiting whom. To Rand, the exploiters were the politicians, abetted by their business cronies that churned out government programs, laws, and regulations. They claimed to be acting in the public's interest. But instead, their interference created economic havoc, social injustice, and poverty providing the excuse to implement more programs and more regulations. It's the fight between the makers and the takers, the people that make things, and there's the people that take things, uh, the class action lawyers, the government, the moochers, and the looters. To Rand, these looters were the later day version of the communist thugs who had confiscated her father's store in the name of the people, but who in actuality were nothing more than criminals. But just as guilty, Rand said, were the victims of these crimes because they allowed them to happen. If there are degrees of evil, it is hard to say who is more contemptible, the brute who assumes the right to force the mind of others, or the moral degenerate who grants to others the right to force his mind. 
Ayn Rand held this doctrine she called the sanction of the victim. If you're being persecuted, by a moral code, you must above all refuse to endorse that moral code. This willingness or passivity, said Rand, stemmed from a misguided sense of duty to one's fellow man, a moral requirement to subjugate and sacrifice one's own interests to the service of others. The word she used for this sacrifice of self was altruism. The bombshell in Atlas Shrugged is the uh, attack on altruism and the proof of selfishness as, as a virtue. Altruism is an impossible moral code. You cannot live on the policy of give everything you have to the poor. Sacrifice yourself. Don't eat, because somewhere somebody is hungry. You'll be dead. So everyone who accepts the altruist morality has to compromise. They have to say, well, Jesus was a perfect example of altruism. He died for others, but I can't, I'm not about to die, so I make a few compromises. A lot of people don't understand the definition of altruism. Altruism really says otherism. It says, by definition, everybody is more important than you. That's what altruism means. So a lot of times when people talk about altruism, they're just talking about benevolence. Rand wasn't t attacking benevolence, but she was attacking self-sacrifice. She had this very precise idea that you shouldn't sacrifice yourself to other people, but nor should you sacrifice other people to you. You have a fair and equal relationship. You treat each other as equals. Nobody takes advantage of anybody else. In our language, you know, selfishness is cutting the line in the grocery store and taking the parking spot that someone else wants. Very negative connotations. When she says the virtue of selfishness, she doesn't mean selfishness in the conventional sense of being piggish and taking more than you deserve or more than you earned. So hearing her say these things, it sounded like she was attacking, you know, goodness itself. I'm challenging the moral code of altruism the precept that man's moral duty is to live for others, that man must sacrifice himself to others, which is the present-day morality. This wrong-headed moral code of self-sacrifice, Rand said, provided the weapon for government to take advantage of and eventually limit and control free individuals. That weapon was guilt. Most Americans go out then, we pursue a career, we try to make as much money as we can, try to feed up families, buy a nice television, buy a nice home, live life as much as we can. But there's this tug, right? If you know that you should be giving more of your salary to the poor, but you know what, you can't be bothered because you want to buy a big TV, so you're not going to do it. When the tax man comes around or the politician comes around and said, look, we're just going to take a little bit more off of your income, which you should be giving anyway out of your own free will, how can you say no? You have no moral, ethical foundation to object to higher taxes, to more regulations, to more controls, because you know deep down that you're guilty of not helping your fellow man enough. That's what altruism and the morality of sacrifice does to people. My morality is based on man's life as a standard of value, that his highest moral purpose is the achievement of his own happiness, and that he must not force other people nor accept their right to force him, that each man must live as an end in himself and follow his own rational self-interest. Doesn't mean you can't be benevolent. Doesn't mean you can't help if you want to help, but says it's not an obligation. And they go, oh my God, if it's not an obligation, you are sentencing the rest of the world to doom and you're a fascist. What bothered her the most was the idea that government would tell me to help you. The Russian Revolution, it was the government taking from me to give to you. She never said, I can't, I'm not gonna give to you. She said, it's my choice to give to you. Did you want to know who was John Galt? I am the first man of ability who refuse to regard it as guilt. I am the first man who would not do penance for my virtues or let them be used as the tools of my destruction. I am the first man who would not suffer martyrdom at the hands of those who wished me to perish for the privilege of keeping them alive.
This concept of self-sacrifice, said Rand, was squarely at odds with the principles upon which America had been founded, the same values that had brought her to preeminence on the planet. Ayn Rand loved the original founding principles of this country, that an individual has a right to his own life, freedom of speech and freedom of religion, and the, the right to pursue his own happiness, the right to own property. Thomas Jefferson always talked about how bad it was for uh, government to take uh, people's wealth under the guise of wanting to uh, help other people and take care of them. He had a very clear view of the role of government and the uh, potential evils of too much government and uh, too many people trying to tell you how to live and what is right in, in your life. You know, before Jefferson, before the thinkers and the Enlightenment, we always existed for somebody else's good. Good the king, good the state, good the church. Nobody existed for their own good. What Jefferson said is that each one of us has a moral right to our own lives, the moral right to our own happiness. And that's the idea that created the most successful and the most benevolent society in history. The idea is this, who owns your life? Do you own your life? And if, if you say yes, then, then that's individualism. Statism is the idea that the state owns you in some sense. You belong to the collective. What's really under attack is the pursuit of happiness. It's saying that nobody has a right to their own life, that everybody is a slave to somebody else. Somebody else's need gives them a right to your life. Rand was developing a philosophical system that she felt very strongly about, that she wanted to embed in the novel, and she wanted the novel to demonstrate that philosophical system as much as demonstrate the virtues of capitalism. So it had multiple agendas. She thought it was going to be a simple project. She quickly discovered that she was going to have to create a whole new world of ethical thought in order to support her heroes and show why they were right. I'm halfway through the writing of my next book now. Its theme will be to glorify the American industrialist, and the background is mostly railroads and the steel industry. I can't tell you much about the story except to say that I think it'll be better than The Fountainhead. Rand began to write it in the mid-40s, 1945 and 1946, and she thought it was going to be easy. The Fountainhead had taken her uh, eight years to write, and she thought that she would be able to finish Atlas Shrugged in three or four years, because she thought all she had to do was to translate the lessons of The Fountainhead. My novel is gathering speed as it goes along. I was moving like a heavy freight at the beginning, but I'm a good passenger train now and hope to become an express pretty soon. She kept telling people that Atlas Shrugged, it's almost finished. She had hundreds of pages written by 1947, and she didn't publish the book until 1957. While she wrote, Rand shopped for a publisher. An editor named Hiram Hayden brought Ayn Rand to Random House, and my dad at first thought it was a, an unlikely match because my dad had published a lot of progressive books and Ayn Rand was not a progressive. She grilled him for hours about his politics and everything, but he found that much to his surprise that he liked her tremendously. She was very charming. And um, when it was all over, she picked him and said that he was the only one who gave her honest answers <laughs> among all the publishers. He didn't pretend to be more conservative than he was. Her work was all she had or wanted, but there were times like tonight when she felt that sudden peculiar emptiness, which was not emptiness but silence, as if nothing within her were destroyed, but everything stood still. For once, she wanted to feel herself carried by the power of someone else's achievement. As men on a dark prairie like to see the lighted windows of a train going past, the sight of power and purpose that gave them reassurance in the midst of empty miles and night. Atlas is built on an unusual plot device which is not naturalistic in any sense. It's not even realistic. It's completely detached from any journalistic reality. In Atlas, I felt completely as if I'm building the whole universe. 
reason these characters are heroic characters is they forsake their own treasure and their own creations because it's become polluted and corrupted in the society. And now they want to start all over and get rid of the looters. You know what? Them. I'm tired of kissing everyone's ass to run that railroad and the money's going to the looters. People running that railroad, I'm the guy that built it. I want it to be a certain way. I own it. I feel Dagny's pain just because she loves her job so much. And even though she doesn't agree with what's happening, she has that connection because she's wanted to do it her entire life. And she has so much invested and she's worked so hard. Most days I want to be Hank Reardon. Some days I think I'm Eddie Willers. And once a year I dress up as Dagny Taggart. But those records are sealed. We love Dagny Taggart. The way she dealt with her brother, the wimp and then everyone else around her just wanted to keep it all going and selling out. Hank Reardon had to fight everyone to get his ally made. Even the, the union guys wouldn't build a bridge. Everyone stopped him. So against all odds, what do you do at that point? The train scenes are fantastic, and the view of New York is a kind of crumbling, dysfunctional dystopia. She could make you know, an iron smelter seem kind of sexy, right? You know, she could uh, make a steel mill seem like a monument to the human spirit and human creativity. The Dagny, dressing like Dagny part was a joke, right? That's, we should, let me talk right to the camera there. I swear by my life and my love of it, that I will never live for the sake of another man, nor ask another man to live for mine. It's perfect. But just as Rand's heroes are larger than life, her villains, too, are broadly drawn. The villains in Atlas Shrugged are primarily the people who like to tear down the good people in some way. Another type of villain that you have is a businessman who isn't concerned about necessarily producing values, uh, instead maybe wants to just kind of make money, who are happy to take the government handout. Dagny, I'm your brother. It's your sin if I suffer. It's your moral failure. I'm your brother, therefore I'm your responsibility. But you failed to supply my wants. Therefore, you're guilty. All of mankind's moral leaders have said so for centuries. Who are you to say otherwise? Mouch and Taggart and Boyle and uh, the guys that come from the government and are here to help, um, it's quite the opposite. To hell with them. Why should we worry about them? We've got to run the world for the sake of the little people. It's intelligence that has caused all the troubles of humanity. Man's mind is the root of all evil. Those who are big are here to serve those who aren't. If they refuse to do their moral duty, we've got to force them. There was once an age of reason, but we progressed beyond it. This is the age of love. The novel's action peaks with a radio broadcast by the mysterious, yet omnipresent, John Galt. The John Galt speech took two years to write. It was the worst agony that Ayn Rand had ever been through. It was just so painful. And I don't think that the pain is completely uh, invisible. <laughs> you can feel the pain of writing this thing. The anger and the condensation of it, it's, uh, it's an astonishing thing. Man has no automatic code of survival, no automatic knowledge of what is good for him or evil, what values his life depends on, what course of action it requires. Man must obtain his knowledge and choose his actions by a process of thinking, which nature will not force him to perform. Man has the power to act as his own destroyer, and that is the way he has acted through most of his history. She didn't try to be subtle. She, she pounded her philosophy in. If you read the novel once, you, you heard her philosophy more than 10 times. Did you wonder what is wrong with the world? You are now seeing the climax of the creed of the uncaused and unearned. All your gangs of mystics, of spirit or muscle, are fighting one another for power to rule you, snarling that love is the solution for all the problems of your spirit and that a whip is the solution for the problems of your body. Random House Chief Bennett Cerf 
pleaded with Rand to cut the speech entirely, or at least shorten it. He said, John Galt says all this stuff 20 times in the book anyway, and it just slows you down. You can throw half the pages out. John Galt, 60 pages, says au revoir at the end of the book. And of course, after having spent all that time finally putting her philosophy into a coherent form, there's no way in the world she was going to cut a line of that. And uh, she wouldn't let him cut a word. In the fall of 1957, as the publication date drew near, Rand remained cautiously optimistic that Atlas be well received. This is her magnum opus, right? This is everything. This is objectivism. This is her ideal man, finally realized in John Galt. She's got it all tied up, and she thinks this book is going to change the world. On the other hand, she had suffered enough with the reception of the Fountainhead and how little it had been understood and how often it had been mocked for the wrong reasons, she thought, to be wary about what the effect of Atlas Shrugged would be. Random House ordered a first run of 100,000 copies. On October 10th, 1957, they began appearing in the nation's bookstores. And then the critical reaction is unanimously negative. It's not just negative, it's harsh, it's brutal. From the left, from the right, from the center. This is a terrible book, Time says. Is it a novel? Is it a nightmare? It's terribly written, it's cruel, it's mean, its politics are all wrong. There was no hiding the fact that she was in favor of capitalism, self-interest, uh, reason, individualism, and as a result, everybody practically came out against it. The left, the right, the middle, they were all against it. Because it is so radical, because it basically challenges 2,000 years of philosophy in the sense that it says self-interest is good, self-interest is a moral uh, characteristic, that really can set some people off. We have a world that the two biggest things that run our lives are, are collectivist socialism and collectivist mysticism. It's 99% of the world. If you write a book saying those two things are wrong, it should not be shocked that this is going to be controversial. The left hated it because it was pro-capitalist. The conservatives hated it because it was anti-religious. It was attacked in the most vicious terms everywhere. And nobody came forth, nobody came forth publicly to say, this is a remarkable novel. It may not be perfect, but it's ambitious. Its scope is huge. Its uh, detail is astonishing, its uh, mystery is compelling, and its ideas are something that we don't encounter every day. Nobody said that. I was enormously shocked by the state of the culture and by the attacks on Atlas. I had predicted the smears to some extent. I had told Random House not to count on a single good review. If they got one, it's possible, but that would be gravy. But what shocked me was the abysmal stupid uh, hooliganism of the reviews, that they were self-contradictory even within their own terms, total distortions, and that there was nobody objecting to it. What they focus on, above all else, is the tone of the book. You know, Saturday Reviews, Granville Hicks, as much as Miss Rand proclaims her love of life, it seems clear the book is written out of hate. And, you know, they're focusing on a very palpable and real element in the book. It, it has a very angry tone. In early 1958, William Buckley's magazine, The National Review, um, gave Atlas Shrugged to Whitaker Chambers to uh, review. Now, Whitaker Chambers was an ex-communist spy who had reformed, and he'd be, he was a Quaker and a uh, very religious fellow. And he, he gave Atlas Shrugged maybe the, the great classic negative review of all time. <laughs> he, t he tore it limb from limb. Out of a lifetime of reading, I can recall no other book in which a tone of overriding arrogance was so implacably sustained. Its shrillness is without reprieve. Its dogmatism is without appeal. From almost any page of Atlas Shrugged, 
a voice can be heard from painful necessity commanding to a gas chamber, go. And Whitaker Chambers looks at the book and says the message of this book is to a gas chamber, go. He felt that Rand had become the thing she loathed, that she was intolerant and uh, Stalinistic in her approach. He sees it as just an evil book, condemning people who aren't Rand's heroes and creators, condemning them to nothingness and saying, you know, you are not important to the human race. You don't value, you don't matter. Like the famous scene where everything is falling apart and they demand that the train go through the tunnel. The train is heading towards a tunnel and everybody's heading towards their death. And she puts thoughts in each person on the train's mind that show some level of responsibility for what's about to happen. The man in bedroom A, car one, was a professor of sociology who taught that individual ability is of no consequence, that everything is achieved collectively, and that it's masses that count, not men. So there are no innocent victims here. But, it, but it's not direct responsibility, it's indirect responsibility through, you know, uh, errors and bad ideas. The man in room at seven, car number two, was a journalist who wrote that he had the right to inflict physical force upon others, to wreck lives, throttle ambitions, strangle desires, violate convictions, to imprison, to despoil, to murder, for the sake of his own idea of a good cause. Atlas Shrug explains it's ideas that you held necessitated this falling off a cliff, this, this economic, political, cultural disaster that we're heading towards. And she kills off those characters like they all deserved it, you know, the heck with them. So that spirit of intolerance really frosted Whitaker Chambers. To some degree, she expected that because Buckley was in the competition with Rand for what was going to define the conservative political movement in the United States. But she did not expect the Whitaker Chambers review. Whitaker Chambers was a very much admired intellectual on the right. People paid a lot of attention to this review and it kind of set the tone for everything that happened for a long time after that with Atlas Shrugged. Rand is absolutely crushed. This is not what she expected. She spends days in her apartment crying, and she says to herself, I just want one person. I just want one person to stand up and say, this is an important book. This is an important writer. She has an important message. What an achievement. And not one person stands up and says that. She wanted my dad to complain to the Times and get another reviewer than the one who did review it. Um, and he said, it won't help, I, because they have it in for you for other reasons. Her philosophy was so radically to the right of, of where a lot of academics and reviewers were. Now, that shouldn't affect the way you read a novel. When a reviewer should say, I don't agree with this, but it's a great book. How she maintained the illusion that businessmen were going to come to her aid, that they were thinking people and interested in ideas, and they'd see that she was supporting them, and they ought to support her, I don't know, but she was wrong. She's just shattered. She feels all alone. It's an absolute crisis in her life. But despite the widespread critical scorn, Atlas Shrug quickly proved to be a popular success. Atlas Shrug almost immediately went on the New York Times bestseller list. I don't think it ever got higher than four, but it stayed on the bestseller list for four or five months. Uh, two years later, uh, when the first paperback edition was published, uh, and went back on the New York Times bestseller list uh, on and off uh, over a period of a couple of years. Rand had always resonated with the reading public, but with Atlas, she had gone after the thinkers, the movers and shakers of the economic, political, and literary world. It was their thinking she had hoped to change. She wanted some intellectual credibility. She wanted other intellectuals to stand up and say, She's accomplished something, and it never happened. With Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand completed her life task in some sense. The fact that the critics were so universally against the book, and the fact that she had nothing more that she was fueled to say combined to make it a very difficult period of her life. Atlas was a <coughs> the climax and the completion of the goal I had set for myself from the age of 
seven or nine. It uh, expressed and stated everything that I wanted of fiction writing. And the thing that worries me about my future in fiction is that the real incentive, the motor uh, of my interest in fiction is gone. I mean, it's complete, it's fulfilled. Rand never published another work of fiction. She would spend the rest of her life doing what she'd vowed not to do after the Fountainhead, explaining and defending the ideas contained in Atlas Shrugged. As the years passed, Atlas Shrugged remained in print, and Rand enjoyed an enthusiastic following. But the author remained a controversial and polarizing figure. Her young friends encouraged her to go out and make speeches about what the ideas in Atlas Shrugged were. And so she started to go to college campuses, and she was a huge hit. Ayn Rand gave these rousing speeches about the virtue of selfishness and the value of individuals living for themselves. At a certain point, she became emblematic of the ultra-right in people's minds, of the right-wing lunatics in America, right? Oh, she's a Nazi. She's a right-winger. In an era when Vietnam and all the liberal stuff was going on in the United States, to say <laughs> an aficionado of Ayn Rand is like saying, I love Adolf Hitler, that wasn't too popular. She was a controversial person herself. Her manner, her lifestyle, everything she did was not of the mainstream. She was a bomb thrower, you know. That's why she played great in the media, you know. But sometimes she undercut her own goals. And she made it hard for people to take her seriously as an intellectual. She was intimidating. I mean, she was so brilliant, and, and but so on target all the time that if you said something that was a little off as far as she was concerned, in other words, not on point, uh, she let you have it, but I loved it. When she was once asked why <clears throat> she titled a book The Virtue of Selfishness, she said, I, I gave it that name for the same reason that you don't like it. She was against the grain. Make it white, make it black, don't be gray. And she was, Iron Man was never gray. In 1972, coming off his enormous success with The Godfather, Hollywood producer Al Ruddy set his sights on another best-selling novel, Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. I was no different than millions of people who read the book who always loved it. As a producer, after The Godfather, I got a Academy Award. It was the most important novel still not filmed, the most important novel of the 20th century that had never been done. And I figured, I'm the guy to do it, right? Ruddy contacted Ayn Rand's agent in New York. So I call up Curtis Brown. I tell him what I'd like to do, and he said, Al, oh, oh. everyone in the world has been through this office to do that project. Now, I can get Ayn Rand to meet you because she loves The Godfather, just out of respect for you. But I can tell you, you're not gonna get it. I said, just get me a room with it, that's all I'm asking. A few days later, I go to the Curtis Brown office, which is half a floor overlooking Madison Avenue. In the center of this huge room, there's like 20 chairs, is a little love seat in front of his desk. And sitting in this small love seat is this diminutive woman, Ayn Rand. <laughs> so I walked in. I squeeze into the love seat next to her. <laughs> I put my arm around her. She said, this, darling, what books do you read? I said, I don't read a lot of novels, I, but I've read yours twice. Oh, fantastic. I said, but look, I, I said, I'm, I'm not interested in this book as a, uh, as a political missive or diatribe of any sort. I'm into it because it's a great love story. It may be the greatest part ever written for a woman. Darling, I'm so glad you see it that way. It is a great love story. She says, I like what you're saying. This is anyhow, in short order, have a big press conference 21. I'm announced as the producer 
of Atlas Rock. How do you feel about uh, doing this book? Can you express that? I think, first of all, it will make a very successful commercial film. Uh, I also think that what the film has to say is a very contemporary message that was a prophecy that Miss Rand made 15 years ago that has chillingly come closer to reality. So I think the film, again, uh, has a chance to make it commercially and critically. And uh, that's the great potential that you reach for in any property that you try to do. Ms. Rand, do you have any comment to make about the prophecy that was made in Atlas Shrug? Only that I'm sorry it's coming true so exactly. However, as I said, Natalie Shrugged, there is no predetermination about history. We still have a chance to prevent the disaster. And I think this is perhaps one of the steps toward the prevention. We were going uh, the other way too long. Now, this may be a very welcome turning point. Ruddy's proposed cast included some of Hollywood's biggest names. I was going to do with Clint to play Hank Reardon. Bob Redford to play Galt, Faye Dunaway to play Dagny Taggart, and Alain Delon to play Francesca. I mean, I literally had these people in my hand. And we're all going along swimmingly with the contract. Now we get to the last point, and she says, I must have script approval. I said, uh, I can't do that. I said, all due respect to you, I'm John Gold says goodbye to America, 60 pages in your book. That's not cinematic economy. I can't give you that. I can't get any major direct on that basis. So we went back and forth. I said, I must bring this to a head. I said, I'm, let me be as blunt as I can be. So I know how you like to deal. So I'm going to deal with you the same way. I will never give you script approval because I can't get the movie made. However, if I have to wait till you drop dead, I will, to get the book, to do it the right way. She's telling me, I put in my will, the one person can get it is you. I said, I'm a producer. I'll have someone else get it and give it to me. So the answer is no. If you can't agree to it now, I'm out of here. And I walked out. By the time Ayn Rand died in 1982, three million copies of Atlas Shrugged had been sold. Yet critics and detractors believed that the prophecies contained in her epic novel had died with her. Winter had come early in the last days of November. People said it was the hardest winter on record and that no one could be blamed for the unusual severity of the snowstorms. The inhabitants of New York had never had to be aware of the weather. Storms had only been a nuisance that slowed the traffic and made puddles in the doorways of brightly lighted shops. Now, facing the gusts of snow that came sweeping down the narrow streets, people felt in dim terror that they were the temporary intruders and that the wind had the right of way. said that Atlas Shrugged was set in the day after tomorrow. And we've reached that day after tomorrow. People are rebelling. People are now feeling the feelings that the good people in Atlas Shrugged felt. Enough. Stop the sacrificing. Return to freedom. Loosen the controls. They always raise our taxes. They spend our money, and we don't know how they're spending it. People have experienced the idea of uh, Big Brother, and uh, they don't necessarily like it. The idea that uh, bureaucracies can, can manage people's lives better than people can manage their own lives. In the name of the general welfare, read Wesley Mouch, to protect the people's security, to achieve full equality and total stability, it is decreed for the duration of the national emergency that Point one, all workers, wage earners, and employees of any kind whatsoever shall henceforth be attached to their jobs and shall not leave or be dismissed nor change employment under penalty of a term in jail. 
in the year 2007, the 50th anniversary of Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, U.S. federal regulation agencies employed an all-time high 238,000 people. In that single year, those agencies issued nearly 4,000 new regulations. By the end of that year, another 3,800 regulations were already in the works. You know, Ayn Rand wrote Atlas Shrugged, she said, one of the purposes was to make her predictions not come true. Well, now it is happening. When you see that trading is done not by consent, but by compulsion, when you see that in order to produce, you need to obtain permission from men who produce nothing, when you see that money is flowing to those who deal not in goods, but in favors, when you see that men get richer by graft and by pull than by work, and your laws don't protect you against them, but protect them against you, you may know that your society is doomed. Did you know that 50,000 regulations were added during the Bush administration? The Bush administration. 50,000 new regulations in the Federal Register. This is the regulatory state. They were the ones who created the problem. The housing downturn and the surrounding uncertainty are significantly impacting our financial institutions and capital markets. 2007 also saw the nation reel. As the real estate bubble burst and the mortgage industry collapsed as millions lost their homes, the crisis was blamed on greedy bankers loaning money to unqualified buyers. If government wasn't so all intrusive, if they weren't setting arbitrary rules, if they weren't trying to get the whole country into a house they can't afford, there would not be a profit to be made by trading securities in houses people could not afford. When people say capitalism caused the housing bubble, that is not true. If the government decrees that everyone should have a blue house, I don't blame the painter that's painting the house blue. They were doing what was the cleverest thing to do under the crazy rules that were set up. If they didn't do these things, they would be even crazier. The government, through its immoral and practically moronic laws, ruined things and then came in and said, well, we have to fix them by passing even bigger laws. In 2007, Atlas Shrugged sold a record 185,000 copies in paperback. The following year, 2008, as financial markets plunged into freefall, the government seized lending institutions and shut down brokerage houses. Politicians and pundits cited unbridled greed and capitalism run amok. Unfortunately, people are misidentifying capitalism with crony capitalism. Because a capitalist system, people get to fail. <laughs> yeah, they get to be very successful, but they also get to fail. And, and I think at a gut level, the average person realizes it's unfair to allow people to get rich and then not let them take, you know, get the downside of that process. And that's what crony capitalism is. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic process. You remember that Eisenhower in his farewell address warned the country about the military-industrial complex. That's really what he was talking about. He was talking about this uh, kind of unholy alliance between two institutions that should be antithetical. If not enemies, they should at least be wary opponents of each other. But the government is there to regulate, not to pick winners and losers. And as Mr. Fold was pleading with Secretary Paulson for a federal rescue, Lehman continued to squander millions on executive compensation. If you don't want bankers to be taking multi-million dollar bonuses, don't subsidize money that goes into the financial system that is what makes these bonuses possible. With the world careening toward financial meltdown and global recession, the U.S. government responded with emergency measures and bailouts that seemed literally ripped from the pages of Atlas Shrugged. You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. When Rahm Emanuel sits around and said, never let a crisis go to waste, neither did Wesley Mooch, and neither did Orrin Boyle, and neither did Jim Taggart. Every time things got worse in Atlas Shrugged, they said, well, we need a new rule. We need a new directive. It's like reading the book. 
3.6, every person of any age, sex, class, or income shall henceforth spend the same amount of money on the purchase of goods per year as he or she spent during the basic year, no more and no less. So people who have memory of that are going, wow, you know, she really was right. And they had to sort of, I guess, see it to believe it. When you have made evil the means of survival, do not expect men to remain good. Do not expect them to produce when production is punished and looting rewarded. Do not ask who is destroying the world. You are. In 2008, over 200,000 copies of Atlas Shrugged were sold. They can see she predicted these things, and, and if they're smart, they can see that there's also there's more than prediction involved there. She's, she's identifying the cause. There's no way to rule innocent men. The only power any government has is the power to crack down on criminals, declare so many things to be a crime that it becomes impossible for men to live without breaking laws. Back in the internet day, I was running DoubleClick, and, and all of a sudden, the internet companies were, became very, very successful. And we had lots of politicians. It's my first exposure to politicians, and they were kind of lined up at the door. Well, first they tell us, you know, I'm in charge of the committee that is setting rules that could, um, you know, if you make bad rules, could destroy your industry. And we you know we'd really like to understand, you know, how we can help you and make good rules. And then, you know, as they're walking out the door, they'd say, oh, by the way, how much money do you think you could raise for us? Did you really think we want those laws to be observed? We want them broken. You'd better get it straight that it's not a bunch of Boy Scouts you're up against. We're after power, and we mean it. We've lost half a million jobs each month for the last two months. In the first six months of 2009, nearly four million Americans lost their jobs. Meanwhile, the national debt continued to rise. They're spending a sick of it. We're going broke. They're spending money that they have never earned. It's our money. We've earned it. And we haven't uh, sanctioned them to spend it in the way they're spending it now, for their own good, not for our good. During that same six months, over 300,000 copies of Atlas Shrugged were sold. By 2010, the U.S. government had committed trillions in bailouts, rescues, stimulus plans, and other financial initiatives. Washington, listen to us clearly. We are spending money we don't have on social programs we don't need to fix problems that you have caused. For many, many years, people said, well, Atlas Shrugged's a nice story. It is fiction. Uh, it's theory. I think what's happening right now in America over the last two, three years is that people are seeing that story playing out in reality. If people see what's going on and they're saying, why? Why, why are, is government behaving this way? Why is the economy collapsing? Why did bankers do what they did? Why did all this happen? They still are not looking for those abstract ideas that explain it. Atlas Shrugged provided those abstract ideas. These theoretical ideas are contained in the philosophy Rand called objectivism. Objectivism is really a radical new philosophy. It's not consistent with what's called traditional conservative right, and it's not consistent with, with, the, with the left either. It's, it's closer to classical liberalism. It's not really far from the ideas the Founding Fathers had, based on the sanctity of the individual, based on the belief that reason is man means of knowledge. Do you ask what moral obligation I owe to my fellow men? None, except the obligation I owe to myself, to material objects, and to all of existence, rationality. Ayn Rand loved America. She called it the noblest country in human history. And her philosophy is really the implicit philosophy of the Founding Fathers. Our Founding Fathers 
wanted regular people to take a quick break and go to Washington to represent the greater good and then go back to their farming or their company or their law practice and somewhere along the way we lost that and we developed a cadre of professional politicians. Nobody wanted a government of functionaries. They wanted a government of people representing their constituents. This whole concept of a powerful central government is just, you know, the founders are spinning in their graves, uh, along with Rand. It's, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it, this country was founded by folks that are trying to escape that very situation. Look at the language of the Declaration of Independence. The right to the pursuit of happiness. That's selfishness. Your happiness, your individual, private, selfish happiness is considered a right. Guess what, what Alex Shrug was all about and Rand really celebrated was the individual. Whatever that individual is, it doesn't necessarily matter as long as that individual is not, not uh, coercing something out of somebody else. Uh, then it's fine. I knew Andrew was on a quest in her fiction writing to portray what she called the ideal man. Uh, John Galt, of course, is the culmination of that, but, but Dagny and Reardon and Francisco and all the lead characters in the book really all serve that purpose of portraying what a heroic life can be and whatever career you choose and whatever level of ability you might have. So the whole idea was to write the book, to convince Americans to turn back in a more substantial way towards the ideas of capitalism and individualism. Um, and, and one could argue that that failed, that, that America hasn't listened to Atlas Shrugged and as a consequence is going to have to live through Atlas Shrugged. First page of Atlas Shrugged, it says, a bus goes around the corner, expertly steered. And you know, that's Rand saying, you're a bus driver, kudos to you, that's a big machine. Getting it through a city street, that's a skill. That's something I admire and I endorse. Anything can be a field for human endeavor and human genius and human creativity. Productiveness is your acceptance of morality your recognition of the fact that you choose to live, that productive work is the process by which man's consciousness controls his existence, a constant process of acquiring knowledge and shaping matter to fit one's purpose, of translating an idea into physical form, of remaking the earth in the image of one's values, that all work is creative work if done by a thinking mind. There's kinds of new medical treatments and drugs and so forth. Uh, there's great improvement in automobiles and all kinds of different things. And somebody invented all that stuff. Somebody came up with all those ideas. And they've improved our standard of living and improved our quality of life and extended our lives. And we all actually owe those people. And that there are people in society who want to con almost condemn those people and say, well, they owe us more. Who is John Gall, the guy who produces and creates, who innovates, who, um, who's the guy that we're lucky to have in our society and the guy that we should be promoting and assisting with everything we do. And the, and the only way to do that is to leave people alone. The Robert Barons made a lot of money. Let's just stipulate that they were horrendous human beings, which they weren't, but let's stipulate that. They left us railroads, they left us buildings. You know, half of this city, New York, was built by these guys. That money had concrete uh, reality, and we have something to show for it. We now have tied ourselves down with so many regulations, so many lawyers, so many everything, that we can no longer function in a kind of real-time way. Dependency sounds attractive, and the people who promote it think it's going to be a wonderful thing, but, um, but practice shows it has not been. You're not doing those people a favor. You're, in fact, enslaving them. 
With dependency is a form of, of enslaving them. If you get to the point where all you're doing is keeping everybody alive to do nothing, then I think you've hit the, the ultimate dystopia. If we don't change our philosophical beliefs, if we don't move away from altruism and pragmatism, the, the free munch mentality we have in the United States, in 20 or 25 years we have some very serious economic problems. We have huge unfunded actuarial liabilities in Social Security, huge unfunded actuarial liabilities in Medicare. We're now at the point where we can no longer afford the welfare state, where if we don't give up the welfare state, we're going to collapse as Greece has, as Ireland is on the verge of, as many European countries face economic disaster, so are we. What are we going to do? The welfare state is required by altruism. We are our brother's keeper. But we're going to die. We're going to starve. We can't feed our brothers. We don't have anything more to give them. And that's the story of Atlas Shrugged. What happens when the looting runs dry? Mr. Reardon, if you saw Atlas, the giant who holds the world on his shoulders, if you saw that he stood, blood running down his chest, his knees buckling, his arms trembling, and the greater his efforts, the heavier the world bore down upon his shoulders. What would you tell him to do? I think the way real people go galt, the way real people withdraw their services, is they work less hard, less well, and less independently. I don't think many people are in actually just a physical position to, to fully, you know, it, 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 it's, it's not so realistic, uh, it, it, you know, depending on your money in the bank and depending on the state of society to go, well, I'm doing nothing anymore, I'm on strike. Most people won't starve for this principle, but people will pull back. Many men that retire early are just fed up with a lot of things that go on and just said, you know, the heck with it, I got enough money and I just don't want to do this anymore. That outcome is not necessary, it doesn't have to happen. In fact, all we have to do is return to the principles that made America great. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, individual rights, free markets, limited government, less regulation. We have a phenomenally entrepreneurial society. So that there, a negative outcome is not mandatory, but it will happen unless we change direction. That Atlas Shrug has so more hardback copies of the, any book in the world outside the Bible. Only book that's topped Atlas Shrugged and Hardback is the Bible. They did a survey amongst their literary critics and English professors of the greatest novels of the 20th century, and they did an online survey amongst the mass readership. Well, amongst the, the English professors and literary critics, uh, James Joyce's Ulysses was considered the greatest novel of the 20th century, and Atlas Shrugged didn't make the top 100. Amongst the general readership worldwide, Atlas Shrugged was considered the greatest novel of the 20th century, and Joyce's Ulysses didn't make the top 100. In the early days, nobody would even say that they liked Ayn Rand at all, if they were going to be in any part of academia anywhere. I was in a college course, and I brought up the fact that I thought Ayn Rand had some interesting ideas. And I was young, you know, I was uh, uh, kind of young and innocent. And boy, oh boy, my professor, he went on about what an idiot I was and what a terrible novelist she was and how her ideas were so, uh, so evil, self-serving, uh, uh, materialistic that uh, I should be ashamed of myself for even bringing it up in class. Some of my friends saw me with Atlas Shrugged and thought I'd join a cult, which was a little bit strange. It still happens. Uh, people think you're some sort of jerk for talking about the ideas that you're talking about, but uh, it happens less frequently. A lot has changed. There's much more openness and the viciousness with regard to attacking the book. A lot of the edge has gone from that. A lot more people have positive things to say about the book than ever before. And now today, if people say that they are influenced by Rand's philosophy, at least in some circles, that's something respectable to do. It's never like an even-handed sort of reaction. It's always tends to be like, oh yeah, she's, she's really idealistic, she's really great, but she's just not practical. She can't work, her ideas can't work in this world. A lot of times you hear people that criticize Rand say, well, that's a very idealistic view. 
I think it's a strength. <laughs> Idealism is right if the ideas are right. It's not being idealistic that's bad. Action. In June 2010, 54 years after the novel was first published, and 28 years after Rand's death, an independent film version of Atlas Shrugged began production in Los Angeles. This is the uh, Henry Reardon scene, mansion scene, yeah. where uh, he, he goes home after having created the uh, Reardon medal that first night, and he has in his hand uh, the, the bracelet for his wife. I think it's gonna be good. I'm concerned about the modern setting. I'm really glad that they went with unknown actors. I'm just concerned that they're, it's gonna be too Hollywood, Hollywoodized. I'm excited for it in terms of I wanna see these characters come to life. Uh, more so than what I've had in my head. Um, and then at the same time, I'm just as fearful that it might not be what I hope it is. The film failed to reach a large audience, but on the weekend it opened, sales of the book reached an all-time high. My buddy comes over with this gigantic book, and he said, it's called Atlas Shrugged. I said, well, why are you reading? He said, because my father told me that I can't take over the family business unless I read this book. I had a friend who was reading the book, and he was really into it, and he's like, dude, you got to read this book. And I'm like, it's 1,200 pages. It's kind of a massive commitment. My boyfriend's dad told me to read it. I think that he thought it would make me like more useful girl. <laughs> So I bought the book. I mean, I had to read the book at that point. Um, and then about, I, th I think about 150 pages in, I had decided it was the best book I'd ever read. When I started to read it, I couldn't put it down. It was really great. I read the whole thing in like a week and a half. I love seeing characters, heroic characters that I could look up to. I think before I had ever read it, I thought, no. I was confused about the way a lot of things worked in the world, like that I didn't expect things to be like that. The way my parents um, raised me to think about morals and what was right and wrong. Young people see that people who produce, who are honest, who are good, can achieve things and can have a good life and have values in their life and that they don't have to feel guilty about it. It characterizes evil in today's world, but what really what was really important for me is that it uh, characterized good, that it that it characterizes use of the mind and use of science and technology as a moral accomplishment. They actually see a sense of justice that the people who are true and good actually win out and the people who are bad end up getting what they deserve. An older person reads the book and says, that's not the way it is. It's not like that. It doesn't work like that. That's silly. And, and moves on. The young are trying to define who they are, what life has to offer. They haven't necessarily given up yet and sold out. But by the time you get people in their 40s or 50s, many of them have renounced any ambition, any idealism. They've become cynical. And the common answer was, oh, I read that when I was really young. I used to love it when I was young. Well, what happened? You know, did you like give up on your dreams or something? Their excuse is they, that they grew up. Uh, my interpretation would be not that they grew up, but that they gave up, and they gave up on themselves. With Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand attempted to change America's direction by redefining and emphasizing the core values of individualism and freedom that had made her great. As to the ultimate success or failure of that effort, only time will determine. But Rand's personal hope that her ideas might reach and affect America's thinkers and dreamers, that dream continues to be realized. The fact that sales are through the roof of Atlas Shrugged got to make someone incredibly optimistic who shares my worldview. These are the right ideas. And so when these sell half a million a year and if half the people read it and, and if half the people love it, that's a dramatic difference in the world. In the history of mankind, whenever a culture has started to go down, 
Greece or Rome or you know, uh, in the Enlightenment Europe, whenever a culture has started to go down, it's never been able to reverse itself. It has slid you know, in, into the abyss. I think America is gonna be the first great culture in history who started to go down, went a long way down towards the abyss, and then reversed course and went back to greatness, became even greater than it was originally. We believe about a million kids are reading Ayn Rand in high school, whether it's Anthem, Fontenhead, or Atlas Shrugged. The exposure Ayn Rand has right now in the culture is unprecedented. But I think this is just the beginning. I mean, uh, I think project 10, 15 years out, we will have had uh, 15, 20 million kids who've read Ayn Rand in high school. We'll have two, three, four, five hundred programs at universities where she's being taught. She will be everywhere in the culture, and I think finally she'll get the respect she deserves. You and I, we believe in life, but you want to fight for it, to kill for it, even to die, for life. I only want to live it.